Revenge of the Flying Dutchman was a SpongeBob SquarePants game that came out in 2002. The PlayStation 2 version came out on November 21st, but the one for Game Boy Advance came out on September 10th. Today we'll be looking at the home console version developed by Big Sky Interactive. Personally, I've had the worst string of luck when it comes to this game. It's actually kind of funny. When I first had it for the PS2, it would stumble through the opening credits and freeze at the menu screen. I could never get past it, so I ended up getting another one. This time, I could get to the gameplay, but it would crash before I could do anything. So I got another one. This time, I could actually play it, but I had to constantly save because it would crash at random points and ruin my progress. So yeah, I eventually wound up with three copies of this. One's been lost to time. I later found out I wasn't the only one who encountered bugs in this. There's an infamous glitch in the PS2 version where the game will crash while you're trying to enter a new area. Something along these lines happened while I was recording this, but we'll get to that later. The GameCube version is better if you want to avoid that. But aside from the bugs, let's get to the game itself. I think I speak for most of us who grew up playing this when I say, it was frickin' terrifying. The colors are dim, the atmosphere feels a bit uncanny, and even the plot is really kinda dark for a children's game. You summon a demon who goes around snatching all your loved ones, who also happen to be your favorite cartoon characters, and they aren't seen again until the very end. I always used to dread finishing a level because I didn't want to see the cutscene of someone being taken. But this is a big game with a lot to it, so let's jump on in and see how it holds up. The main menu is actually really creative. You're in the Krusty Krab kitchen and you move to the spot you want to select. You can even check out some bonus features. They treat this whole game like an episode, starting the theme song and showing a title card. There's no background music during it, so the uncanny feel is already starting to show. We then see Spongebob waking up after dreaming that Mr. Krabs had to close the Krusty Krab. Totally not foreshadowing. What's interesting to note is that this game uses a lot of voice clips that were frequently used in Super Sponge, Operation Krabby Patty, and Employee of the Month, as well as just the entire AWE series in general. I have the feeling today will be like no other day! I have the feeling today will be like no other day! As a kid, I really wondered why Spongebob often said the exact same thing with the exact same inflection, even when the games were completely different. I've heard people criticize the graphics in this, but I don't think they're the worst I've ever seen. I really just wish there was more vibrance. Everything just feels so... dark. I guess if that's the mood they were going for, they succeeded. So you move around your house and figure out the basic controls. SpongeBob also has this giant carpet now. Instead of a double jump, hitting the jump button twice will make you glide. You also collect pants to serve as extra lives. Like in Legend of the Lost Spatula before it, when you're down to your last hit, you're in nothing but your underwear. Also, the background music is extremely catchy. I found myself humming it just going about my day-to-day -day life. You also have the most handy feature in video game history right here. It's great that a Spongebob game allows you to defecate. So you need to find a stick so you can play fetch with Gary. The French narrator actually speaks to you directly to give you hints. This phenomenon is never explained, but I don't think we're supposed to read too deeply into it. When you throw the stick, Gary finds a treasure chest that Spongebob chops open. This spreads doubloons everywhere. Inside, he finds a dirty bottle that he instantly cleans. This summons the Flying Dutchman's ghost. I guess that's one way to summon an evil spirit. I usually just play songs backwards in the bathroom at 11 p.m. He consults his book on ghostly doings to figure out what he's supposed to do. He says that he has to make whoever disturbed his treasure part of his ghostly crew, so he gets ready to take Spongebob away. Hold on there, Mr. Dutchman, sir. Uh, technically speaking, it was not me who found you. Gary's the one who dug you up. Okay, is it just me, or does this seem really out of character for Spongebob? Sure, he shows regret for it afterwards, but he clearly understands what's going on. Maybe they could have changed the dialogue or made it a slip of the tongue or something. It's the line that single-handedly starts the plot, after all. But the Flying Dutchman vows to come back for Gary and leaves. So with this foreboding premise over your head, you have to explore Bikini Bottom and hopefully find some help. I'm just putting it out there, if a paranormal entity came into my home and tried to steal my pet, I'd be getting the proton pack in two seconds flat. 
So as we explore, we get to see what mechanics the game has to offer. You collect the doubloons that somehow scattered all over the ocean despite being opened in your house, and you also learn about your abilities to body slam and karate chop. You have to collect tiles that spell Spongebob's name, but you don't know why yet. You follow a to-do list on the menu that tells you what you need to do to collect each tile. A lot of these require you to go around Bikini Bottom and interact with the characters in it. You have to help Patrick by breaking something on his TV antenna, and you can even go inside the Krusty Krab to fight this rowdy customer. I mean, no one's there yet, and he's probably angry about it. Also, you see all these jellyfish flying around? Well, you have a changing tent that you can enter to change into your jellyfishing outfit. You'll use these a lot for different purposes as the game goes on. You can catch jellyfish that'll sting you if you aren't fast enough, but you can also use the net to ride hooks and reach higher surfaces. Most stages require you to collect a certain number of doubloons and to catch a certain number of jellyfish. One later instance requires your game total instead of your stage total, so you better start collecting right away. To catch these green ones, you have to sneak up on them. They can be a real pain sometimes, but your residence is the easiest location to work through. Once you find all the tiles, you get spun into this puzzle game where you uncover them to reveal the location of a treasure chest. They're never too complicated to figure out. I'm not sure why you're inside Spongebob with pieces of the stage flying around you, though. But once you see the treasure, you go to find it with a new outfit and a metal detector. You can use it to figure out which direction to move in, but this first one is basically right out in the open. The Flying Dutchman's Dining Sock. Then we get a cutscene of the Flying Dutchman stealing Gary by hypnotizing him. So yeah, we sure helped a lot there. But apparently Mr. Krabs has some important news, so you have to race Squidward to the Krusty Krab to hear it. This is really easy if you actually care about winning. There, we find out Mr. Krabs is closing the restaurant because no one wants to leave home anymore. Wow, this came out in 2002 and they were already ahead of the times. SpongeBob makes an offhand mention of bringing the Krusty Krab to people's homes, so Mr. Krabs gives you a bus ticket and tells you to meet him downtown. As the game progresses, you use tickets to ride buses to each location. You do it by jumping on certain benches by your house or the Krusty Krab. So after taking the Bikini Bottom Transit Authority, you head downtown and meet Mr. Krabs. He gives you food and tells you to deliver it to a certain address. Then you travel the streets, avoiding thugs, jellyfish, evil snails, and open sewers as you try to bring the food to the right house without getting hit. You have to follow the shapes and numbers on the houses to figure out where to go, but it's easy to get lost in this map, especially when trying to find Mr. Krabs or the entrance to another location. At the same time, it's cool that you get to explore downtown at night. In most games, you only come here during the day. But after your delivery, you head to the construction site to bring food to the foreman. This was the first time my child self ever heard the word foreman. Here, you meet Patrick, who gives you a Mermaid Man costume in exchange for food. The costume is awesome, and you can shoot water balls with it, but you hardly ever get to use it. More often than not, you'll be in your jellyfishing suit. You do have a puzzle with it right here, though. Once you're done with your deliveries, you head to the high-rise apartments and get a really interesting stage with a side-scroller perspective. The high-rise is difficult to navigate your first time around, but not so bad when you get used to it. Then you head back to the residential district and learn that another delivery boy is going around. So now you're being timed to get to every house before he can. You have plenty of time as long as you follow the signs. You then find out it's Patrick, and he's clearly working for Plankton despite claiming that it's Mr. Krabs. I'll admit, this is a bit confusing. It's super important that you deliver the food before he does, but if he's also delivering Krusty Krab meals, doesn't that mean Plankton already has the Krabby Patty recipe? Maybe he's delivering chum, but that wouldn't make a difference because it isn't what the customer ordered anyway. They'd just turn it down. Maybe he's giving them bad Krabby Patties to trick them into thinking the Krusty Krab's gone bad. I don't know, but Mr. Krabs tells you to follow Patrick and find out what he's up to. Then once you leave, Mr. Krabs is taken by the Flying Dutchman. If this seems unexpected, it's because he explains his reasoning in Squidward's cutscene. Though the game pushes you to go downtown, so a lot of players would probably see this before Squidward's. But we don't have to follow Patrick just yet, so let's see what Squidward's up to. He's having a yard sale and reading a book called How to Defeat Evil Spirits. Wow, how convenient for the plot. You can also buy this hive that Spongebob thinks is an acorn to give as a gift to Sandy. There's a whole process through the dialogue to build up why Spongebob wants to give Sandy a gift, but you have to do everything in a super specific order to see it chronologically. Anyway, remember the delivery mission? Yeah, for every delivery, you receive tip money in the form of sand dollars. Ironic, since the doubloons look closer to real-life sand dollars. You spend these to get the acorn, then you also have to steal Squidward's book. 
You do this by sneaking up on him and stealing it while he's sleeping. Once you get it, you read that you need to find the Flying Dutchman's seven Chaos Emeralds, I mean seven treasures, when he was alive. These will help you fight him. We were kind of already doing that, but thanks for giving us proper motivation. Then Sandy shows up and you can go talk to her. You can't give her the gift yet, but she challenges you to a karate match. You then have a unique segment where you have to smash a bunch of items faster than her. As long as you keep smashing the attack button, you should be able to speed ahead of her. It's also fun to attack her and keep her at bay. Then once you win, you can go to her tree dome. It's soaking wet, so you don't need your water helmet. This is because Sandy got fired up from your match and chopped holes in the walls. So now you throw acorns into each of them to plug them up. Once they're all plugged, you can finally give Sandy the blasted acorn. Then she finds out it's actually a hive as her dome is swarmed with bees and wasps. So now you get to jump across the top of her tree to body slam the hive out of it. This can be a little challenging, but at least it isn't as hard as the tree jumping stage from Super Sponge. Then you have to catch the bees and wasps in place of jellyfish. Then you get another karate match with Sandy in her room. Again, it isn't too hard. You can also run on this hamster wheel, but you really just have to keep jumping. Once you find the treasure and leave, the Flying Dutchman comes to hypnotize Squidward. Here, he mentions that Gary has been such a good crew member that he wants to collect even more to replace his current lazy crew. You're also brought back to your room with a fresh pair of pants floating around whenever you finish a stage. I'd say that's a good starting location, really gets you back into it. But anyway, let's follow Patrick. It's easy to keep a safe distance, and there isn't really any major punishment for being seen. Predictably, he leads you to the chum bucket where a robot Mr. Krabs is commanding him. It turns out to be Plankton, who's opening a theme park called Chum World. It's his new money-making scheme that will put the Krusty Krab out of business. I'm not sure how he even got the money to make it, but I won't question it too much. He heads off to Jellyfish Field, so you go after him to get a ticket to the park. Luckily, there's a jellyfish flying around with a bus ticket to Jellyfish Fields. You can catch it, and then you'll be met with the most complicated level in the entire thing. At the same time, there's a lot to see here. There are playgrounds, other fish messing around, boats floating along the rivers, and even more. You can even frolic through all the flowers. They really cared about making the most of this location. You have to meet this guy named Rusty Scupper at a bait shop with a corral. He's holding a contest where the winner is the first person to collect 100 jellyfish. He says that whoever wins can select any prize from inside the corral aside from the racing snails, but there's only one other thing in the corral aside from the racing snails. Obviously, you need to win, but what's nice is that they count the jellyfish you collect overall rather than just the ones you catch in the stage. At the same time, this stage requires a lot of patience. To reach a new area, you have to jump on these... things that shoot tendrils out from the top. You have to wait for them to go back down before jumping to the next. If you fall, you have to start all over again. You then have to ride these giant jellyfish to the top of high platforms. There, you collect pearls and ride to other platforms to use them to open chests. If you fall, you have to start all over, now while carrying these giant pearls. Then after that, you ride the great white jellyfish while jumping over platforms that come in front of you. This section goes on for way too long, and you can't miss a single jump or you have to start over. Then you meet Plankton and ask for a Chum World ticket, but he's instructed all of his clowns not to give you any. While searching for one, you get a funny segment where Patrick eats a tile. You knock it out of him by attacking his tummy, then it flies out and you race him for it. It's really easy, but Patrick is hilarious to watch during this. Then it's back to patiently waiting for giant jellyfish so you can jump on them and start whole obstacles over if you fall off. It's especially hard when you have to ride five of them to reach this sunken ship. You even have to do it again to find the treasure. But once you find one of Plankton's clowns, you fight him for the ticket and he goes down in one hit. How kind of him. And finally, once you have all 100 jellyfish, you can win the contest and get the reef blower from inside the corral. Rusty discourages you from taking it, but again, it's literally the only weapon if I can't take a snail. But once Spongebob puts it on, he accidentally knocks the corral down and scares all the snails away. Looks totally deliberate if you ask me. So you have to blow them all back in, giving you some good practice with this new item. Then after you find the treasure, Patrick is next to be hypnotized. As much as I appreciate how much effort went into the jellyfish field stage, this is the one level I absolutely dread whenever I play through this. The platform sections are very unforgiving, and it can be tedious to collect 100 jellyfish if you haven't been trying up until this point. But before you do anything else, you have to head downtown to help Sandy clean up balls of garbage by blowing them into sewers with your reef blower. Then she gets taken by the Dutchman. 
That's what she gets for making me go back to an earlier stage this late in the game. Also, Larry's now waiting at the bus stop with an E tile on his belt. <laughs> this could be the new incarnation of the E meme. He has an extra bus ticket for a friend, but SpongeBob wants it. He says he might trade it for 50 jellyfish that he can make his favorite snack with. Why not just bring him some urchin chip pie that worked in the last game? Now this is the part of the game where you get blasted with fetch quests. You just had to collect 100 jellyfish, which were subtracted from your total, but now you need to collect 50 more. You basically have to collect nearly every jellyfish in the game right after they just made you go through every stage to grab every jellyfish you saw. That means you'll have to hunt down the ones that are harder to find this time around. But in the meantime, let's head to Chum World. Now this is a great location. It's a theme park with games to play, rides to jump on, and a lot to see. I always enjoyed coming here. You can play carnival games in exchange for tiles, and you can even enter the big top after shooting a series of targets for a clown. Hey, where's he going? Back to the sea where he belongs. Farewell, old friend. But all that being said, the big top isn't exactly my favorite thing in the world. You launch yourself to the top with a cannon, then you have to jump to different platforms without falling off once. You also need the jellyfish net for this, so make sure you don't come up here with any other outfit. Some of these platforms can be just as unforgiving as the ones in jellyfish fields. You also have an audience that cheers you on and boos whenever you fall. Though I imagine if a performer actually fell from this height, the audience would make a much different sound. So now are you ready for another big pain in the back? Allow me to introduce you to the chum putt. For some reason, the toughest Spongebob stages always involve rolling a ball. Well, and arms. And cephalopods, I hate those frickin' things. In this, you play a strange game of mini-golf where you use your reef blower to push a ball into goals. You have to hit every goal and push it up inclines and past obstacles. If it falls over the side, you have to start over. Yeah, you really have to put in the work with this. But aside from the course itself, this park gave me a completely different problem altogether. After beating the round, killing all the bad guys, and collecting all the doubloons and jellyfish, I found that whenever I tried to leave the area through either exit, the game would completely crash. I thought I could just reload my save, but it didn't work. Consistently, both exits would crash the game and there was nothing I could do about it. I was stuck in this one area with no way to continue playing. So what did I do? Started the whole thing all over again, religiously saved, and kept more than one save file. This required doing all of Jellyfish Fields and the Big Top all over again. Needless to say, I'm never trusting a game like this again. If someone tells you a game crashes a lot, you'd better be saving in more than one slot. After tireless hours, I finally reached where I was and I was a lot more careful with the order I did things in. But after beating Chum World, you still have one tile left. You can't get it yet, so it's off to collecting jellyfish for Larry. Once you get them, you obtain his ticket and head to Goo Lagoon. Here, you can explore a wide array of areas and collect even more sand dollars. Ugh, another fetch quest. We also meet the lifeguards, who serve as enemies. Hey, no running on the beach! Get off the beach, runt! I thought I told you to slow down! Yeah, their lines are absolutely hilarious. I love how they cut through the music very awkwardly like that. The developers really wanted you to hear what they had to say. So basically, everyone is aware of the Flying Dutchman now, so they're all buying bottles to trap him in. To buy one, you need to collect sand dollars. You also need to get Larry's belt for his tile. For some reason, Larry is really mean in this. Meaner than he ever was in the show. Try to keep your distance, okay? I don't want my friends to see us talking together. Now stop talking with me, okay? People might see us. Oh, there! Once were two fellas who met on the beach. One needed a belt that seemed out of reach. That's it. I'm out of here, dude. To get away from you, Larry heads to the top of the lighthouse, so you have to climb it. Whoa, why is Fred so big? These windows can actually be a challenge to work around, but the top of the lighthouse looks really cool. Looks like we're about to have a final showdown. But once you find Larry, he goes to hide from you in a shipwreck. In the meantime, you'll likely collect enough sand dollars to buy that bottle. The shipment is coming in, so you have to cross this dock to reach it. Once you reach the edge, the Flying Dutchman takes over the ship and crashes into it, meaning you have to run away. 
These lifeguards don't seem to care about their lives being on the line. They're upholding the no running rule even in the most dire of circumstances. Still no running on the beach. I will say, this chase goes on for a while, so it really hurts if you fall and have to do it all over again. From even before the cutscene, nevertheless. Then once you get out, you can go back in the wreckage to find the tile and a bunch of doubloons. Not a big fan of this platforming portion, since everything is just barely within jumpable distance, but you don't really have to stick around. Back at the beach, you can jump across umbrellas and lifeguard towers for more tiles. To unearth more towers, you fight this group of lifeguards that get bigger as you defeat them. Then you find Larry at the shipwreck. According to him, he won the belt in a championship, so you have to beat him in the same competition to win it. Then you get your last karate stage where you smash objects to win. It's harder than either of the sandy stages, but once you beat it, you get the tile and can explore the ship for another one. After you find the treasure, the Flying Dutchman comes to take you personally, but the power of the treasures you've collected prevents you from being hypnotized. Hey, go easy on me. I'm not the ghost I used to be, but who is? So now you head back to Chum World and chase Plankton to steal the final tile from him. It's really easy. Then you find the treasure and go back home just in time for the Flying Dutchman's ship to fly overhead. They drop cargo on you, so you have to flee outside. I guess it's capable of phasing through your roof. Then you see a cannon that you can use to launch yourself into the Flying Dutchman's graveyard. Well, that went well. It's not as spooky here as it would later be in Battle for Bikini Bottom, but it's filled with lava and obstacles. Only you can save them from the revenge of the Flying Dutchman. Hey, he said it. Thankfully, the pirates here are angry because the Dutchman likes his new crew more than them. They're willing to lend you their cannons to aid you in your quest in exchange for one thing. My booty! Oh, believe me, I have no interest in touching your booty. Someone grabbed my booty! Now that is one loaded booty sack! Aren't you the one who's been digging around in my booty? Oh, do you mean the booty stuffed in the crack of this ship? His booty is bigger than anyone's! But he still comes out here to get his hands on even more! He just can't get enough booty! Will you let me use your cannon if I bring you some fresh booty? Sure, if you can make it across that inferno to the next ship. I think I saw some just kinda sitting around over there, if you catch my drift. That sack was so big, I could barely get my hands around all that booty. I could have sworn I saw someone who looked like you just before my booty was pinched. I used to love warming my booty in this place, but now I have no booty at all. So if I understand this correctly, you wouldn't turn down some new booty, even if it came wrapped in dirty old canvas. Are you kidding me? Everyone wants more booty, no matter what package it comes in. And I'd much rather be playing with my booty than guarding this old cannon. Yeah, the writers really went ham with the adult jokes here. I wonder if they let the Super Sponge developers take over for a bit. For each pirate, you have to navigate a path filled with ghosts and skeletons to safely bring a treasure back to them. <sighs> We're collecting sacks because someone grabbed a pirate's booty. I thought this was a kid's game. They get harder as you go, but you can find safer ways around some of them. Once you clear one, you have to shoot yourself to the next ship with a cannon. It isn't as hard as you'd expect it to be, but you might find the treasure hunt confusing because you have to use every cannon to launch yourself to it. It's clever, though. Then when you reach the Flying Dutchman ship, you go around snapping all your friends out of their trances. Then they board a little boat that circles the bigger one the entire time. Once you've saved them all, the Flying Dutchman shows up for the final battle. The narrator then tells Spongebob that the book on defeating evil spirits was actually outdated and the treasures only make him mostly immune to the Dutchman's power. So now you have to fight him. You avoid his minions and fiery breath while waiting for bombs to drop. Then you pick them up and throw them at him. And then... Wait, what? What happened? I lost? No, I won, but I also lost. I got the cutscene for winning, but then it switched to the game over cutscene. Not to mention the Flying Dutchman disappeared in the middle of it. No idea how any of that happened, but I had to do it all over again. Once you win, you suck the Dutchman into your bottle and get on the little boat with all your friends. You then sail off and talk about the big celebration you're going to have. After having to play through the entire game a second time after encountering the Chumput glitch, 
This was the single most relieving cutscene I had ever seen. So that was Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. And what can be said about it? It isn't a masterpiece, but there are a lot of things to appreciate. Let's start with some of my favorite aspects. I like how the environments are used, and the different mechanics such as the outfits you can change into are a really nice touch. I think the gameplay is fine too. It's very similar to how Battle for Bikini Bottom would later play out. I'm a sucker for 3D platformers based on cartoons, we really need to bring them back. It's fun to play and has a lot of nostalgic value, but at the same time, it could have used some improvements here and there. The glitches speak for themselves, but I also think they could have added more variety to prevent things like the jellyfish catching and doubloon collecting from becoming repetitive. Also, some platform segments could have taken it a little easier on us. At the same time, I can't say I didn't enjoy playing this. I liked working through it and seeing all the different things I could do in every stage. Like I said, the style works. I think it just needed to be touched up a little. It might not be the best SpongeBob game ever made, but there's fun to be had with it. Now I think you all know what's next. We did it with Super Sponge, so we're gonna do it here too. There's one other version of this game that we need to check out, so tune in next time where we'll look at the Game Boy Advance version. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.